We're going to explore together the impact of the rail trail movement over the past several decades and what we think that the future holds. It is incredible that in the span of less than 40 years, this infrastructure has become ubiquitous all across the country. It has transformed the landscape in ways I don't think anyone, Peter, you can correct me, but anyone could really have predicted back when this started. When we look ahead, Team RTC, those of us with RTC name tags on, it says Team RTC, you'll find us. We are so motivated by the potential of the 41,000 miles of multi-use trails that are on the ground. It is, yes, thank you, It is the foundation that makes a nation connected by trails possible. And it is those corridors that are gonna turn into the systems that make it safe and more convenient for more people to walk and bike where they wanna go. And we are all a part of that here together. This room represents the heart, the tenacity, the passion that's responsible for all that we have accomplished. We have former board members and current board members here. We have former staff, including our past president, Keith Laughlin, in the room. And we have current staff, many current staff in the room. We have long-standing partners and supporters. Many of you who have been on this journey since 1986, and many of you who have been on the journey even before that. And I think, if Peter has anything to do with it, we might hear some of those stories tonight. Will Trump. <laughs> so Peter, that's part of what this night is all about, telling the stories that got us to this moment and talking about how those stories fuel the future. And since you published your book just a few years ago, you have been sharing the legacy of the rail trail movement with people all across the country. Tell us what kind of responses you've been getting. What have they been saying? Well, the most, the most fun response and most common and fun response I get is, I had no idea that my bike trail used to be a railroad. <laughs> and then they say to me, I love this trail. Why don't you put them in everywhere? <laughs> and then you say, OK, where would you put this trail? Where would you put another trail? How would you create something so special as, as, as a rail trail that you use every day or use for your uh, recreational uh, getaways? Uh, without having these old railroads. And so I, I, of course, like all everybody in this room, I, I consider rails to trails kind of magic. And it's, it's the magic of how did the railroads create this whole network? How did, how did the railroads contract enough that it left these pieces lying around? And then how did uh, another constituency, which is primarily the bicycle movement, with many, many helpers, uh, take it and run with it. So that's what I tried to put together in the book. And so I learned a lot about the railroad. Uh, I learned a lot of railroad history, which people are interested in. I learned a lot of bicycle history, which is a tumultuous uh, 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 roller coaster of popularity and unpopularity. And, and really when, when the opportunity for creating rail trails out of abandoned railroad quarters came about, the, the kind of fractured bicycle community came together and said, okay, some of us prefer to ride on the road, some of us are scared of riding on the road, all these other things, we're fighting with each other about a lot of things, but we can agree on rail trails. And that's where the, the movement got its start. That's where the movement got its start. And there was so much tenacity in that movement. It took a lot of work to get where we are today. And I, I think so many of us here are inspired by that tenacity. We bring it, and we bring it with us. It has what has made the rail trail this ubiquitous piece of community infrastructure in so many places. But Ryan, as we look ahead, why do we think, why does that matter? Why is it important that rail trails and multi-use trails are so well represented in America? Yeah, well, uh, Peter got the question, like, why can't trails be everywhere? Um, they're getting there, right? It's, it's, a, it's amazing, I think, what, what has happened in, in the last several decades. When RTC was founded, there were a few hundred rail trails. As you mentioned, there are now 41,000 miles of multi-use tra trails. There are 26,000 miles of rail trails across the country. Um, and that's really possible, uh, made possible by so many people here, Peter, you, and David Burwell, really made that possible in terms of this scaling of infrastructure, unlike perhaps we've ever seen in this country. Um, I think what's really exciting now and going forward is that we're going from trails in every state to trail networks in just about every state. And that's connecting trails together into ubiquitous systems. And I shout out Keith Laughlin, who really 
move the organization to really move from trails to really connected systems. And we did some research just at the end of last year on uh, how many of these networks were out there. We found that there were 150 trail networks in some form of development. Ten years prior, the idea was not even, we had to kind of tell people, like, what is a network? And, you know, why is it important? Um, so that's why it's so important. I think we should emphasize, though, that all of trails are widespread. There are still disparities in terms of who has access to them. And in many low-income disinvested communities, safe outdoor access is not guaranteed, and for many of us, it remains a privilege. So it's critically important that we connect this infrastructure. It's really important that we prioritize places that have not had these same opportunities. Now that is such an important aspect of when we look at the power of connectivity and how we can, you can't put a railroad where you want to, but you can think about how we create safe, connected access to the rail trails and the spines of these networks. Community drive and perseverance, they're certainly critical factors to how we got where we're going and where we are and where we're going. But it takes more than sheer will to totally transform the American landscape. And one of those folklore stories, you know, a good little law, as the author of that law described it, the Rail Banking Statute of 1983. And to date, that statute has helped make an estimated 194 rail trails totaling 4,400 miles of rail bank trail possible. And it set the precedent, the legal precedent, right, that this is something that communities could do. Peter, you discovered, and we were very grateful to you for that, the origins of this powerful law when you were writing your book. Can you tell us how rail, rail banking came to be, how it happened? And most people think that Rails to Trails Conservancy created the rail banking law, but actually the rail banking law preceded Rails to Trails and in a way created Rails to Trails. And it, it's an amazing story. Uh, it, it took us, you know, 40 years to actually figure out the story, which is, uh, it was, it, there were two early stories that we never knew when we were created, how, how they happened. One was the uh, Rails to Trails demonstration program that the federal government created in uh, 1978 as part of the National Trails Act. And uh, it, took, it took me dozens and dozens of phone calls. It was really amazing to, to finally find the person who actually created that. He was a, a staff member who worked for Senator Magnuson. He loved the idea of, um, of rails to trails. He was a runner. He ran on the CNL Canal. And um, he loved the idea of rails to trails. And he said, OK, we're, the government is now redoing the entire Railroad Act of the country. It was a $7 billion Railroad, Act, Re Railroad Revitalization Act. And he said, let's put in a little money for rail trails. And they put in what it, it got whittled down to $5 million out of $7 billion. And, it also uh, still happens today. <laughs> <laughs> And they didn't know what would, they, they said we'll, we'll, we'll do a competition. They didn't know what would happen, uh, whether anybody would even apply for it. They got 130 applicants for these, uh, for this $5 million. They whittled it, whittled it down to nine trails. And those nine trails, which included the WNOD in Virginia and the Little Miami, for those of you who know other parts of the country, the Little Miami Trail and the one in Marin County and the one in uh, Cape Cod, um, they, those became kind of the seeds of uh, creating the movement. And so his name was Tom Allison. Unfortunately, he's not alive anymore. Uh, but he's, he's a real hero of, for all of us for having put that in. The other real hero who is, is alive still is Pete Rayner. And that's another amazing story. Um, uh, Congressman Phil Burton, some of you, might, some of you old timers might remember Phil Burton, a real powerhouse in the in Congress. He was working on the National Trails Act, and uh, he said, you know, we really should do something about uh, putting, uh, figuring out a way to save corridors so that they wouldn't get lost if they're abandoned by railroads. And so he, he wrote something, he wrote something that's like, if a railroad is abandoned, it'll become a trail. And then, and then he, 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 and then he, he knew a, he had a friend who worked at the, a lawyer who worked at the, um, at the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service at the Interior Department, and he gave it to him, he said, how would this be, and, and, and Pete Rayner was the lawyer, young lawyer, 
he said, this isn't going to work. This is not, this is not the way. And so he came up with the concept of rail banking, that a, that, a, that a corridor could be banked for future possible use as a railroad. And if it was put into this bank, um, it wouldn't be formally abandoned, would avoid the abandonment process. And so he gave him, it was a two-sentence law, two-sentence uh, amendment. He gave it to Burton. Burton was famous. He said, people, called, people said about Burton, he had, he had 50 bills in his one back pocket and 50 IOUs in his other back pocket and just walked through the halls. <laughs> and he got that bill through. And two weeks after it passed in 1983, he dropped dead of a heart attack. So we were within two weeks of never having that. And that law, so that law, when David Burwell, uh, who Rails and Trails didn't exist at the time, but when David heard about it, he said, you know, I think there's a law that might actually help us do this. And so we started uh, investigating that law, which nobody had ever used. And with the help of, of our legal team, uh, kind of pushed that law to be broad enough to be used by everybody. <laughs> I, I love that story. And we were so grateful to you, Peter, because when you found Pete Rayner, we were able to honor him as the Rail Trail Champion in 2018. And that was such a special moment for him and for us because there had just been no connection to the origins of okay. all that has happened. So that was when I When I finally found him, I said, do you know what happened to your in a little sentence, and he says, no, I don't know anything what happened there. I said, you've created hundreds of trails for them. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like it's twins that separated at birth. And, and, well, and it, was, thank, it was fabulous. Thankfully, he did that work. And, and as a result, rail banking has had an incredible impact on the country. Just those few words have made it possible for hundreds of communities to be able to safely get outside and get around where they live. But let's be honest, it isn't always a slam dunk. There are different interpretations of the law. There's sometimes opposition to the law all the way up to the Supreme Court <laughs> and back down again. So Ryan, how would you describe RTC's role currently in really keeping real banking intact? Yeah, I'd first say that uh, Peter is holding his, his book and he's too modest to promote it aggressively, but uh, you gotta read it. And in fact, in the room right, right next door here, um, they're for sale, Peter will be signing them in part because you're a great writer, Peter, but these stories are amazing, right? <laughs> it's just how real banking was created, the, even the fact that we had to do kind of forensic research to understand, <laughs> I mean, it's just, you can't make it up. It's just, it's, it's amazing. Um, but to answer your question, Brandy, it is a fundamental part of what's made all of this possible, and one of our highest priorities is protecting the rail banking statute. So we have the only legal program in the country uh, dedicated to preserving and protecting rail corridors. We have the country's foremost expert, Andrea Furster, as our general counsel, and that's what we do every day is to make sure that that statute is preserved. And we will go, we've gone as high as the Supreme Court to make sure that that's possible. Uh, and I think we feel really privileged in that we have the support to then provide legal services to groups all around the country who are either don't even know what it is, how do I use it, how do I protect it, and we're able to do that. We do it all for free, simply because we're supported by generous people who believe in it. Um, so that's been, I think, just something that is, as long as we're around, we will protect rail banking. Uh, we have a new strategic plan, which we're, we're talking about in a few different ways, but one thing we're looking at in the years going forward is how do we apply that same systems-based approach to other corridors. And we think there's a lot of potential in public utility corridors at that same scale. Uh, there are great examples of rail with trail. We think we can accelerate that progress as well. That's great. And I'm going to dig back into another little piece of history here, um, and maybe a little other piece of RTC folklore. So there's been the story of this wall map that was used to track rail banking status, you know, the status of rail trails, whether they were in development, if a corridor had been disused, or if they were open. And I heard that there's a different colored pen, and that, you this know, this just kind of mapped along. That's right, mapped <laughs> along the way. And I will say, recently, we found a photo that proved the map was true, which was incredible. We thought Marianne Fowler, many of you know, she couldn't be here tonight, she's not feeling well. Um, but we all thought maybe it was a Marianne story. <laughs> so, and, and we found the photo, and it was amazing. And Peter, in the picture, it's actually up on the um, screen out there, is clearly getting good news about a rail trail in the South East Development. He's grinning from ear to ear and he's pointing. We had, a, we had a bell. We rang the bell. Oh, I love it. You can feel the excitement, and we feel that way too. 
way still, when we learn, if we discover Mary Ellen back there works on our trail nation collaborative, when we discover a new trail network, there's no bell, it goes into a computer. Oh, you need a bell. <laughs> Maybe we need a bell, I don't know. Um, but tell us about that map and how important the visualization was to understanding just the scope of what was happening, the scope of the impact of the movement, and the potential for connectivity that existed, including something we've heard about how you kind of started to see the Great American Rail Trail kind of come into fruition. Yeah. Well, everything is based on data, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the bicycle movement, the trails movement, has over the years has been sort of hoping for, and you get a lot of conversation about, we're planning to do this fabulous thing, we're planning to have a 500 mile trail, and, and we said, okay, we just want to know what actually exists, and what's out there, what's being worked on, and what, what exists. So we've, we got a, a big paper map, you'll see it out there, of the United States, and started putting the pins in, and then we realized, okay, we're gonna have, we're gonna have green pins for uh, open trails and blue pins for trails in the works and red pins for trail emergencies where we have to go out and help them. And uh, gradually, you know, gradually it started taking on a, a fantastic reality. I can't remember, it looks like I'm looking at someplace in, in Kentucky, but I, I, we'll have to find out what that was. But the, the, <laughs> the, map, was, the map was a real, uh, it, it really focused people's attention that things were happening. So the, the very first concept of a long distance connect, connectivity sort of situation was for the East Coast Greenway, running from basically the beginning of the East Coast Greenway was from Boston to Washington, and now it's extended all the way. Um, and now that has evolved into, that, that's in the, in the works, and now of course it's evolved into the cross country trail to the West Coast too. Well, it's clear RTC has been tracking rail trails since the beginning and really been at the forefront of all of that. Ryan, we don't have a map anymore on the wall. How has the practice evolved and how is it helping move us forward? We do have a map. And yeah, the it's not a map. Actually, <laughs> no, it's true. Too. We do. It comes to, and please take a tour. We're offering tours after, but on trail networks. Um, and we need some kind of bell or something, like a cha-ching or something, yeah, yeah. You know, register. Um, we don't have a map, but I think I, another story I love, and I think what, what for me is fascinating is that um, RGC has always been a data-driven organization, it's been an innovation-driven organization, and perhaps coincidentally, but um, our timeline matches very much the evolution of geospatial technology, uh, digital technology. So. Uh, we started with the map, and then as geospatial um, technology just became something, RTC was an early innovator there, and then started to really digitize and really um, use technology to the point where we had, we still have the country's most authoritative uh, database on trails, period. And that was really vital in terms of continuing to advance all of our work, especially connectivity, like being able to really map out in a very technical way, allowed us to see where, the, where, where were the gaps, where could there be networks formed. Um, I'm saying this all precedes me, so this is all me, means not me. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at two of the guys right there, right <laughs> in my view. <laughs> um, but there was a realization that, hmm, I think average people are like this too. And so uh, what I think is just amazing is that Trailwing, the Trail Finder app, was, was really based on a very sophisticated database, not just kind of a consumer product. Uh, and as such, it has allowed millions and millions of people to get outdoors and enjoy trails, as many as 10 million a year behind the, the pandemic. Um, so we're really proud of, of that. I think it, it's, in many ways, it allows us to continue to innovate as we look more and more at how do we create erase those disparities I mentioned before. We've looked at places like Milwaukee and found that from our analysis, you can connect a couple trail segments and serve as many as 200,000 more people in Milwaukee, many of the most disinvested communities. So it all goes back to that map, but it's really fun to see how it, how it evolves. The through lines, right? You know, how things happened in 1986 and how they're happening in 2024. They're slightly different technology, but really, you know, the practices, the practices continue. And speaking of kind of those through lines, I am part of, as you can imagine, many um, rail trail enthusiast groups on Facebook. I like to listen to what people are saying about us and, and the information.
infrastructure. Yeah. And somebody recently shared this map of all of the abandoned railroad corridors in America. And there was all this chatter, oh my gosh, and oh, they're all trails and blah, and everyone was all excited. And when you look at that, at that 30,000 foot view, it's hard to understand the impact People don't really realize, right, that impact that the railroad had on America and why it was so important to save that, those borders and that infrastructure. And Peter, as you've done the research for your book, I'm really curious, do you have any stories or like, what have you learned about how the railroad <coughs> shaped American culture, American life in different ways? Well, the, the, third, the third question I get, or a third comment I get after those first two that I told you about is, Wow, I didn't know anything about the railroads, you know. And, and we in the East are privileged to, to know more about railroads than, than most of the people in the rest of the country who really don't know anything about railroads. But one of the fun things that, that I found and that a lot of people who read the book found is the is the amazing stories about the railroad. I was kind of tipped off about this question. So I'm gonna actually read I'm gonna read you a couple of paragraphs from the book about what railroading was like. And, and uh, of course, there's a huge railroad subculture. Uh, they're, they're somewhat uh, jealous, and not jealous, they're somewhat antagonistic to rail trails because they, they tend to think of them as we're stealing, we're stealing the, the trains away from them, which we're not. We're very much part of the of railroad history. But just sit back for a second and think about this. Although many Americans today have never set foot on a train, railroads from about 1890 to 1930 were at the pinnacle of American culture, setting standards for speed, frequency, geographic coverage, luxury, capacity, efficiency, and panache. On November 21st, 1914, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad, using 65 trains over a four-hour period, transported 33,468 passengers to the Harvard-Yale game in the new Yale Bowl. 65 trains. Three years earlier, the Milwaukee Road had unveiled the 72-hour Chicago to Seattle Olympian, whose observation cars contained a ladies' tea room, a men's smoking room, a library, a buffet, and also offered barber and bath service. <laughs> Within a couple of years, further amenities included a telephone for use in terminals, tailor service, and special Olympian grants containing news and stock market reports. Electric lighting was standard, and all cars were vacuum cleaned daily en route. Some trains had pianos, and at least one Pullman Palace car had an organ for Sunday church services. In 1934, the stainless steel Burlington Zephyr, a three-car train that was so light, made out of aluminum, so light that the uh, manufacturer devised a publicity gimmick of pulling it with a 10-man tug-of-war team, <laughs> made the 1,015-mile trip from Denver to Chicago in 13 hours and five minutes at an average speed of 78 miles an hour, Denver to Chicago. In 1894, St. Louis opened Union Station as the largest station in the world, <clears throat> with 42 track gates serving 18 different railroad companies. Mm. However, even at the height of railroading, Americans indulged their pent-up frustrations and their funny bones by coming up with humorous renderings of local trains that they both loved and vilified. They called the New York, Ontario, and Western the old and weary. They called the Lake Erie and Western the leave early and walk. <laughs> and they called the Toronto, Hamilton, and Buffalo to hell and back. <laughs> and the railroad wasn't just for passengers. In 1888, mail trains employed more than 5,000 clerks who gathered, sorted, and distributed 6.5 billion pieces of mail from uh, on, on 126,000 miles of railway, often using iron posts to grab and to toss mail sacks as the trains went through the station without even stopping. The mail cars also had slots where people could go put their letters and postcards in while the trail, train is standing in the, railroad, in the railroad station. Among the most important trains in the 1920s were the silk trains, which transported live Chinese silkworms in their cocoons from China, from the port of T Tacoma, Washington, which came from China, to eastern markets. One Milwaukee Road silk train with 15 heated cars and traveling faster than a passenger train 
was valued for insurance purposes at $4.8 million. If the worms either died or ate through their cocoons before the train reached the east, the whole shipment was ruined. Wow. That is a snapshot of the cultural impact, was, right? And yeah. just how life had changed. And for so many small towns, the railroads were a lifeline. They were a lifeline to American culture. They built connections in different ways between people that had never happened before. Um, they created economies that hadn't existed previously. They also divided a lot of places. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that and to acknowledge that. And I think when we look at what the railroads delivered, what in some cases they took, but then what happened when they left, the rail trail in its place really is a symbol of hope. And Ryan, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, so you've you heard us use the word connectivity or connections um, often, and it applies here too. And it's not just about connecting trails, it's about what trails do to connect people and communities in really important and profound ways. Um, as you said, many of these communities that when rail service um, ended really suffered. And at the same time, we've seen in many cases where trails then have, have been developed, transformed into what are called trail towns in many cases. And in many cases, the trail becomes almost a new main street to these communities. Um, and that's, you know, for all different forms of investment and, and economic activity. But I know there are some, uh, more than a few hardcore cyclists here, but you know, what I've heard is in, in um, my own bike touring from then breakfast owners or others is that they love bike tourists because you can't carry much when you're on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> right? Even if they had panniers, right? You, you have to buy stuff. You simply <laughs> need to use the amenities in where you're going. And so it makes for not only a great experience, but ultimately a, a different form of connecting to communities. Because us as visitors on trails, um, we're on the ground, and we're not behind the windshield. And so I think we're inherently more inclined to connect with places and then invest in them, and we see that all over. Yeah, we sure do, we sure do. And you know, I'm gonna go back in time again and say, I saw that in the 1990s in Massachusetts when the Minuteman Trail first opened, and I have to say there's someone else here who was part of the 500 Rail Trails One Great Idea. <laughs> press campaign so we have all of all of the angles covered here today but i remember i was a teenager and i remember the throngs of people who were out there walking and rollerblading and biking and i had just never seen anything like this happen before and my parents got real excited when they took us on way too long of a bike ride and we did get ice cream and and i came home and i'll never forget the day because it was there was lots of emotions that happened that day um but i had no idea what it took to make that trail happen. I just knew this thing happened, my parents took me there, and that was that. And unless I had worked at RTC, I probably wouldn't know that today. And I think a lot of people don't fully grasp what it takes to actually make a trail happen. The amount of advocacy that gets poured into trails. So Peter, when this movement was getting started, can you share a little bit about what that advocacy looked like? Well, the trail you're talking about, the Miniman Trail, goes from just outside of Boston to Lexington, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, it was in competition with a whole bunch of other trails. Who could be number 500? This was the fi this was back when people celebrated Columbus Day, and it, it had to do with you know Columbus 500th anniversary of discovering America. That was under the the old. Um, pre-woke uh, understanding. But um, the, the, the guy who was leading that trail effort <laughs> explained that it was an 18 year effort to create that trail. 17 years of politics and one year of construction. <laughs> and that was pretty standard. Uh, and and I'll, I'm gonna do a little slideshow after this. I'll show you uh, how trails came online and, and how the abandonments, you can, you can track the abandonments are about 12 to 15 years at, uh, before the, the actual trails get created. It's, it's interesting to track. Um, I feel like it had a lot to do with the fact that the that people who like to bicycle, people who were scared of, of uh, being on the road with cars and liked to bicycle and wanted a place away from cars, were able to unify behind rail trails, something that the bicycle community was never able to do uh, beforehand because you had, the, you had a major split in the bicycle community about whether bikes should be like cars or whether bikes should be like walkers. And, and the technology is between those two things. 
and by finding these abandoned corridors that weren't being used by cars uh, and uh, being able to unify behind that, it, it created a tremendous amount of, of power that the, that the bicycle community previously wasn't able to do. And the, the flip side of that is uh, the, the occasional, I, I don't know, for some of you who know, uh, in Virginia there's a road called uh, Old Dominion, uh, uh, Old Dominion Drive, runs from Arlington to, to um, uh, McLean. The reason it's called Old Dominion is because it was the old Washington Old Dominion Railroad. That used to be a rail, a railroad, and, and that was taken over by cars, and that's, that's the one great route that would be able to go uh, out, out through the hills of Arlington that unfortunately is now not at all bicycle. bicycle. It's quite a big road. Yeah. yeah it's well, quite it's a big road. Yeah. Isn't that pretty rolling? No, it's oh. very flat. It's, it's the flattest oh, route yeah. of, of all. Of all. Oh, good. Yeah. So there was a lot of advocacy in the beginning and a lot of bicyclists coming together. And I think that story from the 1990s out on the Minuteman Trail, there was a lot of people that weren't biking. They were walking, they were rollerblading. As we've dug into some of the archive of photos, we found lots of rollerbladers. There were so many people out there, out there rollerblading. Um, but it's interesting when we look at where we're going and the impact that has happened over just a few decades and really the transformative nature of multi-use trails on people's lives. Ryan, where do we think the advocacy will go? What do we think that will look like? Who is this movement now? Yeah, well, I would say just, you know, uh, hearing some of the stories and talking about evolution, uh, I mean, I'm priv just so privileged to be in this organization to have this role now. Uh, I'm also just a fan. I'm just, I'm just a fan of, of what has happened and, and to be, um, you know, even a modest part of what's next is just, just quite amazing. Um, but it is quite an exciting time for, for our movement. And um, you know, what I think we all know is that the last few years have affirmed that trails aren't just nice to have amenities. They're really darn important for the well-being of people and communities. And at the same time, we've seen more and more people come to trails, more and more people join our movement, right? Um, you know, cyclists are still such a powerful advocacy Form. But I think what's great is that we're, people are just seeing trails as something that can be for them in all different forms. Uh, and I think, you know, we maybe we haven't said it, but we hinted at it, but all those visuals you saw out in the, in the um, reception area you see here is we've just launched a, a new brand, a new logo, a new brand. Uh, we're lucky that we also moved into a new office. That's part of what is it's all kind of, you know, in some ways serendipitous. But part of what the brand is trying to do is really um, emphasize who trail users are. And there are people from all different walks of life. And that trails really bring a degree of joy and connection that we see in a few other places. So I hope you see just, it's not just meant to look pretty. I think we're trying to really lift up, like, what is that, that true joy and meaning? Um, we also just launched a new strategic plan and happy to chat with folks after that. But, uh, we have a number of goals in terms of proliferating trail networks, increasing funding for trails, increasing equitable access. But I think as we see this growth in our movement, this understanding, our aspiration is really simple. And it's that we want trails to be part of everyone's everyday lives. These aren't just things that some people access. It's not just a thing you do occasionally. Why not have trails everywhere and for them to be part of everyone's experience? That's what we're aiming for. What a wonderful sentiment to then turn to the audience. We wanted to create a little bit of time to have folks here ask questions or share your thoughts. Awesome. Uh, well, I really appreciate this conversation uh, and I appreciate uh, the panelists. Um, so I'm, I'm going to throw you a softball. Uh, what can folks in the audience do to support Rails to trails going forward, you know. Of course, like donations and stuff of that nature. But what what can we do to support your work? Because we're really excited about it. So. Joining a member, supporting the organization, we love having more people be part of you know what we're we're doing. So of course we we value that and welcome it. Um, but I guess what I would say is, as much as we've talked about opportunity and and investment. Um, we're at a high point right now for the trails movement when it comes to funding and public will and support of our movement. Uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law essentially doubled federal funding for trails. 
and it's now we're seeing that implemented all over the place. It's, it's great. We don't want this just to be a high watermark. And what happens in our, our work is that every five years there's a reauthorization of the, of the bill that supports trails um, and all this infrastructure. It's up again in two years. So I think the most important thing for our movement is certainly to make the most of what's happening now, but not to be content, not to consider this inevitable, and right now start thinking in ways that we can be more unified than we've been before to really put as much um, pressure and as much urgency on our, our leaders in Congress to uh, continue this momentum. Because frankly, it's gonna be harder. And I think we're, although we can make a great case for our movement, the climate's gonna be different when it comes to just public spending and investment. So we need to really unite and any influence we have in our own home districts is really, really important. I'm just going to add to that real quick. We have an immediate opportunity for you to get involved in advocacy. We are launching a Champions for Trails initiative, really. So we are, for the first time in a long time, getting in deep with our membership and anybody who wants to get involved to learn about how do you advocate in your neighborhood, in your community to get involved. Um, and I would say the very first step is go out on the trail, take a picture, post on social media, tell people you love this stuff, right? Let's yeah. raise the visibility. It's an everyday activity, but we take pictures getting dressed. We're like, what about my outfit? Hey, <laughs> I'm brushing my teeth. What about, hey, I'm on the trail, right? So lifting that visibility is a big part of that. Let me add to something to that, which is, you know, there's still something like 30 or 40,000 miles of tracks that haven't been accounted for. Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is something that I think about all the time. Where are the rest of these tracks? Where else could, they, could we be creating these trails? So uh, every time you drive over a railroad track someplace, on a bridge over a track or whatever, you know, think about where, what is going on here? Is this being used? Is it, uh, is it abandoned? Could we do something with it? So there, there's two, for those of you who don't know, there's two Rails to Trails projects in Washington, D.C. right now. One is in Anacostia and one is in Georgetown. It expands the whole uh, gamut of our <laughs> so, social <laughs> classes or whatever. Uh, one is to save the old uh, uh, Foundry Branch trestle, which all of you have passed uh, by car uh, on Canal Road a million times and probably haven't paid much attention to, but it's still sitting there and can be saved, needs to be saved. And the other is the Shepherd Branch uh, Trail alongside the Anacostia Freeway. Uh, that would be about a three mile new rail trail. So right in our midst, you know, we think, we think well, we're beyond that. No, there's still three, two more rail trails uh, right here in, in town. So we can still create a lot more. And there's a 700 mile plus trail network being developed here too. And we've got one of the leaders of that right there. Hi, Benita Perez, Smart with America. So building off what you just mentioned, um, you talked about reauthorization, you've talked about um, the advocacy movement. Uh, how do we get other people into the movement? How do we make this a kitchen table conversation? Is there things to bring the whole panel to this? There's things that we can learn from the past to the present to make this resonate. You know, I've had the opportunity to go to places like Wheeling, West Virginia, I was just in Alaska last week, and you know, I had the opportunity to talk to engineers and they were like, no one bikes here. It was a foot of snow and there was a thousand people biking. <laughs> but how do we make that resonate with everybody else? And how do we help make that happen? I think it goes back to the visibility, right? Using trails is something that people, they do, they don't maybe talk about it, they don't share. So right in Alaska, there's all the snow, and yet there's all these people out there biking and this person doesn't know that it's happening. So I think we have to tell our own stories of why we're out there on the trails why we're using these spaces, of why they matter, of how they're changing our kids' lives. You know, I talk to folks all the time. I'm so lucky I fell into a home right on the WNOD trail in our home here. And so my nine-year-old can get on a bike and bike to the park as if it was 1995. That's pretty cool, right? That's a really awesome thing. And I tell people, how do you do that? You live in an urban place because we have a trail. And he can be so safe doing that. It's freedom for him. It's incredible. And I think we don't tell those stories often enough, we don't lift up that personal impact. You know, for me, I never was confident enough to commute to work on a bike, and now I do, because I've learned how the trails connect. There's new connections now. I only have to be in traffic for a tiny, tiny bit, you know? That's it, just at the very end. And it has changed my life, I'm physically active. So I think we have to talk about it. We just have to talk about it. We have to not be afraid of someone saying, 
Oh, that's just for you. It's like, no, it can be for you too. Come with me. Come with me. I'll show you. Well, I, I guess I would uh, turn it around and say, what what is the problem? You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very oriented towards what, what problem are you trying to solve? If, if, if you're going to highway engineers in Wheeling, West Virginia, to, to and, and you say, how can we show them that thousands of people care? That that's a that's a very hard way to um, to to make a point. If if you if you have a particular bridge that needs to be saved or a particular track that needs to be converted into a trail, then you can really focus attention and say, this is the problem. We we need this connection, or we need to save this, or whatever it is. And then it's a lot easier to get people involved. Um, so I, I don't see it. I don't see us wasting a, a lot of time just trying to make the whole country love this idea, but but sort of pick out the specific problem that needs to be solved and then find the constituency to do that. Yeah, Where do you fall between us? Well, I think it's a, I think it's a, I think it's a both and, honestly. I mean, I think certainly is, uh, I mean, advocacy and activism is about a prob problem you're trying to solve and giving people an actual action to rally behind. So I, I certainly agree with that, but I think, you know, so much of this comes down to public investment and making choices and, and, and trade-offs. And so I guess I would say in echoing um, or amplifying certainly, I think the the use that is um, in any in the particular way that you have influence, making this clear that this is a politically winning issue, especially across party lines. I think is is in some ways the most important. And we found in places. Um, as historically, not to say this is this is a very nonpartisan issue, although I think some red states have been maybe a little more reticent. We've found states like Indiana, North Carolina to be considering trails like the thing that unites everyone together. So I think that's a lot of it, is just also making sure this is something that leaders of all different kinds can not only get behind, but then can actually um, you know enjoy success in advancing things forward. I'm curious about the east to west coast uh, uh, initiative to build rail trails across the country. Where does it stand right now? Where are you missing holes? Um, is there anything we can do to help make it happen? Well timed question in part because the Great American Rail Trail will uh, hit five years. This is the fifth year anniversary since we, since we launched it. Um, it's 3,700 miles. It goes across 12 states and District of Columbia. It's 54% complete now, which is pretty exciting. Right. Um, About to be 65. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound like a lot, but holy cow. <laughs> yeah, and we've had 40 million in public funding invested. Um, so it's really exciting. And I think in terms of progress, um, before too long, you should be able to go from Washington, D.C. all the way through Indiana without ever having to be alongside a car. Like the East Coast and the West. It's advancing really, really quickly. It's exciting. Uh, the big gaps are, are Montana and Wyoming, where we always knew there would be more to be done. There's just less corridor. There are more gaps. Uh, so in some ways, the 54% is a little bit deceptive because most of that is those two states. Um, but yeah, it's been it's been quite exciting in terms of you're you're the one trying to. Celebrate every month. So how would you suggest we'll get on this? Celebrate every month. Yeah. It's not an activism ask every month, but it is one of those things that's a little tricky because what we have to move is, in a lot of ways, some state governments. And as much as they care about what you think, they don't care as much about what you think because you don't live there. Um, but one of the things we're doing um, as the fifth anniversary comes around is trying to lift the visibility of people who are coming and spending money in the states. So. Here, we've got the easternmost portion. We've got 350 miles complete to Pittsburgh. So we're gonna have, um, launching in just a couple of weeks, an ambassador kit um, on our website. So you can get a t-shirt that says, I'm riding the Great American Rail Trail. You can get little business cards. You can leave with your um, check when you go to a bar. It says, hey, I was on the Great American Rail Trail. Check it out. Trying to get the businesses along the route to understand, because they are gonna be the vocal advocates. They want this, right? Trying to get you know local, local folks to really understand that there's a direct impact of that bicycle tourism. We have all the numbers, we have all the data, but it only goes so far. Um, and that's really one of the things we're launching is a detour route through the West, because what we have learned, we thought people wouldn't try, but they sure did, and they are, constantly. Um, and there's a lot of folks who, who are just kind of putting it in Google Maps and maybe don't understand that they've never been to Wyoming 
I don't know that it could be 100 miles without water or food <laughs> or you know anything at all, even a human being. So the route that we're mapping and releasing brings people as close to the trail as we as we have mapped it so that they'll stop in the towns and build that awareness but also safely gets them to amenities so that they can understand what they're doing so i really think if you're going to be out there on any segment of the great american Rail trail sharing that you're doing that is hugely important um, the other thing i'll add which is a little bit um, further removed but really important is helping support um, funding for the active transportation infrastructure investment program. So Kevin just walked out, but this is a new program that was in the bipartisan infrastructure law and it is dedicated money for connectivity. So it is the only program that exists currently in the country to put bigger dollars into those hard projects that aren't yet done. And it was um, authorized, but it was not funded. So we are now in an annual appropriations battle, which you can imagine is lots of fun. Um, and we are this tiny line item compared to these other massive issues. And so when we are sending out you know, urgent advocacy alerts on those kinds of things, if you're on our list, we hope you all are on our list, we hope you will take action. If um, you, know, you know any of the members of Congress that are on transportation and infrastructure, THUD, et cetera, let us know. We might want to put you to work. That could be really helpful too. And let me add specifically members of Congress and also more fun. So uh, we have events every month just to celebrate all that's happened. But the biggest one is May 8th, which is the actual five-year anniversary. So on May 8th, uh, we will have an event on the U.S. Capitol grounds, um, both celebrating the whole project, but also uh, doing something we've done a few years, um, a few years before, which is uh, launching and celebrating a group called Warrior Expeditions. Uh, an organization that serves veterans with PTSD and connects them with amazing outdoor experiences. Uh, they will be riding the Great American Rail Trail as they've done a few years before. Um, so it's an awesome event. To celebrate their their launch, celebrate the trail. But I think the most important thing, in some ways, is that each year we invite the members of Congress uh, of the districts of the riders. And in, last year we had five senators, something like that. We got a mansion on a bike. Yeah, you're going to make your donation. That was incredible. Awesome. Okay, that's good. Yes. So you all local here, you're certainly invited, but that's, that's one of many chances to really amplify and in, a, in an in-person way just to uh, emphasize how important this is. It's so inspiring. Congratulations to the entire staff and former staff and historian <laughs> of the, the movement. I was intrigued by something Ryan said in the beginning, um, that uh, poor neighborhoods are less served by, have fewer opportunities for rail trails. But I would think that every big city has so many railroads going into it, and presumably a lot of the tracks are, are uh, abandoned. Why, why aren't there whole networks within large metropolitan areas? Certainly there are rail, uh, disuse rail or disuse corridors that have the potential to uh, ultimately form more of a network. Uh, we're working on getting better data, but I would say our experience is that the actual conversions and completions of, of rail trails have been in, um, in less disinvested communities. Often there's just been more political influence, there's kind of more organizing capacity. So uh, we've just seen, just seen kind of all across the country, often there'd be the potential for projects, but just not the same level of investment. But I think what's, what's uh, really exciting is, one, we're working on, this is early, we talked about geospatial analysis, uh, a project to really put data behind this and be able to buy census tracts, identify where there are trails, where there aren't, and be able to target where are their trail deserts that we all need to think about investing in different ways. So and how the funding aligns. That's another yeah. layer in there. Because one thing I'll add to that, Ryan, is that just like the railroads disconnected communities, the federal funding and the public funding hasn't been going to the disinvested communities. So even if the community maybe wants a trail, that money is going here instead of going here. Mm -hmm. And so one of our priorities is helping communities who have been historically under-resourced to be able to have the capacity to apply for those federal grants, to be able to put those federal grants to where it's a lot of work to implement a federal grant as well. So we're providing a lot of technical assistance and support prioritizing those kinds of investments too. Um, the, the trails follow the money, and that has been a big, a big challenge over time. 
And uh, just one one example, but it, it goes to uh, you know, sometimes uh, rail corridors uh, cut off neighborhoods, trails can reconnect them. Um, examples all across the country. One that we're prioritizing is in Milwaukee, and it's called the 30th Street Corridor, which is a subgrade uh, rail corridor that essentially cut these, this low-income community off, segmented it, and then cut it off from the rest of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working to create a rail with trail, and essentially all kinds of connections down into this corridor. Um, we'll see, there's lots to be done, but I think the excitement and really the, the motivation from the neighborhood is it's a, really something that's going to be now a focal point, a connection of that community, reversing what was, in some ways, um, a real chasm in the community. So final statement, we promised everyone no more than an hour. We started a little late, so we were right on time. I'm so proud of us. This is, this is impressive. Um, just a final thought on when we look to the next 40 years, when we look to what's ahead of us, what does success look like? What happens? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I'm so happy that you guys are, are, are thinking about this day in, day out, all the different uh, ramifications of, of what needs to be done, the funding, the, the politics. Um, I, I think these are big questions. They're definitely big questions that need to be uh, uh, considered all the way around. You know, I, I, I'm not really involved day to day with this stuff uh, anymore. One thing, one thing that I've been doing that, uh, from this book, a, a, a filmmaker in Chicago got very interested in it, and is going to be making a documentary movie <laughs> that hopefully will run on public television. So that that could be a tremendous impetus in terms of public awareness of, of and, and, you know, he's going to be looking for some good stories and good visuals and good history. So that that could be really exciting in terms of the uh, of the, uh, the the political. Uh, Movement for the future. I I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching it. Do I know? I'm, <laughs> I'm watching it. Um, yeah, I mean that will. Forty years will exceed our time too. And, you sure know, will. Um, you know, maybe sometime from now, um, you know, we'll be telling this history, and there'll be the next generation talking about it, but they're carrying forward. Um, I guess I'd say it, it, it really is, I think we describe it in, a, in our North Star and our strategic plan, is that um, success is trails are viewed as essential infrastructure. Mm, yeah. That's it, right? They're invested in the same ways as other infrastructure, they're used in the same ways. We all know that, um, or any of us who are, are you know, active in walking and biking, is that most short car trips are a bike ride or a walk away, mm -hmm. if you could do it safely. Mm -hmm. um, I think that success is anyone being able to do that and without any kind of obstacle or hindrance. Cheers to that. Cheers. Cheers to that. What a wonderful